Hello and welcome to a new episode of the CTO Show with Mehmet. My name is Mehmet and in each episode, as you know, I cover multiple topics from emerging tech, digital transformation, cybersecurity, and also I cover entrepreneurship and startups. And also sometimes I have with me guests on the show uh, who are entrepreneurs, startup founders, and subject matter experts. And today I'm very pleased to have with me uh, from the Silicon Valley, Tom Camp. Tom, thank you very much for, and you know, I think many people would know you, Tom, but again, can you just uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you are up to now? Well, first of all, thank you for having me on. It's a great pleasure to be on. And uh, yes, I'm, I've been in Silicon Valley for, oh boy, 25 years and uh, co-founded two companies, uh, one called NetIQ that went public. And then the last one that I co-founded and was CEO of is a company called Centrify. Uh, and that company got acquired by uh, the PE firm Toma Bravo, and they merged it with uh, a company called Thycotic, and it's called Delinea, but I, I left during that uh, initial acquisition. And since then, I've been very busy doing angel investing. I've invested in uh, 15 tech companies, uh, most of which in Silicon Valley, but some uh, overseas uh, from, from me. And then finally, I've been spending time doing a lot of policy advisory work uh, in the United States. We don't have a global, I mean, we don't have a national privacy law. Uh, and so it's really been more up to the states to do that. And I've spent time uh, getting uh, working on a campaign to pass uh, the California uh, Privacy Rights Act. Uh, which is our equivalent of GDPR. And then most recently, yeah. um, I've written a book called Containing Big Tech. And so that that's how I've been spending my time. Thank you very much, Tom. And you know, like you have a very rich career, I would say. Now, uh, we're going to talk about different topics, but just, you know, starting from, you know, having you co-founded Centrify, which is the leading cybersecurity provider, and you invested in a lot of tech startups. Like, what you can tell us about some of the critical factors that contributed to the success of these companies? That's a great question. And first and foremost, uh, startups and tech companies, it's a team sport. And so you really need great co-founders because one person just can't do it all. You, you can't just have a CEO and then a bunch of salespeople and engineers. You really need a founding team um, to, to help you that you can really trust as well. So the first thing that you really need to contribute to the success, especially the, co the companies that I were, was the co-founder of was that I had great co-founders that were really good in their areas. The second thing, especially if you focus more on the enterprise space is you need to have a product that really at the end of the day solves a real pain point. It's a painkiller. It's not, not an aspirin, right? And so there's too many nice to have products, not enough must to haves. I think another area is that you do want a large market and that will help you raise money if you're going to the venture capital route. Um, and, you, and it should be a large market because that gives you room to make mistakes and still succeed. But you don't want to enter too crowded of a market where there's already existing uh, competitors that may have raised more money than you as well. So you want to pick a uh, kind of a more of a merging market um, that is not as crowded, but has the potential to be a big market. And then the, the last thing is, is that um, especially with that version one, the, the MVP, the minimal viable yeah. product, you really should start narrow. Too many startups try to boil the ocean and, and, and try to mm -hmm. come out with like the version five when they really need a version one. And so I call that a bowling lane that you really need to be very targeted um, and uh, allow you to focus on selling to specific types of customers as opposed to, you know, being all over the map as well. So those are four or five criteria, I think, uh, that really contribute to the success of early stage companies. That's very good. Actually, like a couple of days back, I had exactly, you know, a, an episode I, I do solo sometimes as well. And the title was, painkillers versus vitamins. So this is something really that uh, resonated. Now, talking about enterprises, Tom, and you mentioned about the pain point. And because you have founded like mainly like security companies, what I'm hearing nowadays, you know, from customers that 
okay, we know that there is a pain, but actually we are bombarded with a lot of different messaging. So the challenge that we are seeing today in the enterprise, especially in the cybersecurity space, is how really to quantify that pain. Because at the end of the day, if you know, like we cannot see some numbers next to the problem, it's a challenge. What do you think about this uh, topic? Yeah, you know, the, the cybersecurity market is saturated and there's a lot of startups and there's a lot of companies. And if you're the CISO, um, there's a line of about a hundred people, you know, literally out your, your virtual door trying to get in touch with you uh, as well. So it, it becomes very hard, very difficult, especially for an earlier stage company to get the attention. Um, and so what I actually think, especially in the cybersecurity market, having invested, uh, I'm an investor in a number of cybersecurity companies and having founded a company uh, that's in cybersecurity, if you could actually apply your technology to, to other groups outside the CISO, like a great example of that, which I wasn't affiliated with, was a company, Okta, uh, doing this, this, you know, yeah. in the early days, single sign-on. They didn't sell to the CISO because if they, first of all, they were small startup, they couldn't even get it in the door. But if they got in the door, the CISO would say, well, you got to support SAP, you got to support my mainframe and all that stuff. So what they did is they actually attached to the applications, the major applications, and they sold to the SaaS person who didn't have a long line out their door selling security. Another good example of that is HashiCorp. Um, they uh, have a uh, privileged access management product called Vault, and it's the yep. open source Vault IO, and they sell it to developers. And so I think kind of my tip or trick is if you can if you want to have a security product figure out kind of a, a a different path or different buyer be it at the application or at, with the developer etc because otherwise you're going to be number 88 in the queue outside the, the CISO's office as well and he only has time for the top 10 as well so that that would be my big advice is try to find a unique go to market where you can attach yourself to a, a pool of money that resides outside uh, the CISO, who's who's already baked in his budget for the year right. already. Right, it, it's an amazing actually advice, and um, because I think the trap that a lot of uh, I would say startups and even like even like well-established companies, as I'm talking from a personal perspective here, the trap is people think that the CISOs got the money. But actually, yes, they have budgets, large budgets, but everyone is trying to compete over there. The, the better idea would be, okay, let's try to find budget from someone else, as, as you mentioned. This is really very uh, helpful, I would say, Tom. Now, with you, it's, you, know, you have extensive experience. You founded, again, a lot of companies in the tech. What are some of the key trends that you believe are shaping or might shape the future of technology and startups? in the next, like, let's say five years? Well, clearly, and this is everyone's answer is AI. And, uh, and so AI, I mean, there's a lot of attention on AI regarding, you know, generative AI, you know, chat GPT, Bard from Google, et cetera. Like, you know, I ask it a question and it comes out with a couple paragraphs or, or images, text to images, et cetera. But the core of AI is really focus on automated decision making um, and really helping to improve that as well. And so I, I think across the board um, that you know AI is going to be applied to security. For example, I invested in a company in Palo Alto uh, here in Silicon Valley called Uno AI that's applying AI to logs and data and trying to do a better job of correlating that together. Okay, so we understand that, but. There's another company I invested in called Quest AI. They actually have a product that you can draw on a, like a piece of paper or like yeah. within Figma, you can actually draw like, this is what I, my user interface looks like. And it generates the code for the front end. And then finally, I think AI also offers um, the needs and requirements to apply risk and governance uh, to mm -hmm. the actual AI systems. And uh, 
I've actually invested in a company called Holistic AI. They're based in the UK that, that does that as well. So I'm, I'm putting my money where my mouth is. I do believe in AI, right? And yeah. I do believe that AI can apply to security, to application development, to governance and risk management. But then the other areas um, in terms of key trends all revolve around data, right? And so um, I, I mentioned California has the California Privacy Rights Act that upgraded the CCPA. Europe has GDPR. Um, there's more laws coming on board. Uh, Europe is even considering the AI Act. It's only going to it's only going to snowball. So much like cybersecurity really got kickstarted with the rollout of the payment card industry data security standard, which kind of was a stick to get people to to buy. And then you also had Graham Leach Bliley and you had HIPAA, et yeah. cetera. I think the growth in privacy laws um, are going to cause uh, the need to, for people to invest more in privacy tech. And again, by putting my money where my mouth is, I have investments in companies like SecuV AI, Privacy Code, Praveni, uh, et cetera. Then there's another aspect of data, which is, and there was just a decision by the EU against Meta, the 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 owners of Face or the new name of Facebook, mm -hmm. involving data sovereignty, right? And I really think what's going to happen from a geopolitical perspective, there's going to be the need for federation of data, right? Um, and I I really think that um, to address regulations, that data federation. Uh, splitting data across. Um, and again, I, I, there's an investment that I have in a company called Astrin. They're actually based in, in France. And then finally, uh, applying, doing more in geospatial. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we all know that there's Google Maps that has Street View. We all know that there's, uh, you know, you can look at satellite data, et cetera. But what about the health of roads and railways and shipping lanes, um, et cetera. I mean, so I think there's more, you know, correlation of the health of the infrastructure. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, if you look at pictures from Ukraine, that whatever happens with that war, I'm not going to get political with this, but there's going to be a need for a massive uh, rebuilding. Right. And so where do you prioritize, et cetera? And there's an interesting company in Estonia called IV Technology, E-Y-E-V-I Technology, that actually kind of looks at uh, the health of roads and, and applies AI and allows you to prioritize. And I'm, I'm also an investor in that company. And, and even like just using geo, uh, spatial information, geolocation to improve and optimize transportation. I think there's a lot more that can be done. And there's a company in San Francisco called Enroute that I'm invested in. So I do have theses. I have thesis around AI. I have a thesis mm -hmm. around privacy. I have a thesis around data federation and, and geo data and, and it extending its use. And so to me, um, as I look at the crystal ball of, of some of the, the where the technology is going, um, those are the areas that I think are going to be really interesting. And I, I, I'm personally investing in these companies. Uh, because I do see some big opportunities. And the the last thing I'll say is that there's actually this stick of regulation for a lot of these things that will actually drive. Yeah. Otherwise, things are nice to have. But then if you actually have someone in an organization that has to sign off on something, then they're like, oh, we actually have to buy it. And that that shifts you from that vitamin to the painkiller, kind of going back to your initial question as well. Right. Actually, you know, when I start to see recent, and even I had one guest who has a company in Poland for like a satellite image, they provide like kind of APIs. At the beginning, you know, like I didn't understand it, but then when I start to see the use case, oh, this, this makes sense. And actually, yeah, as you said, it can become a painkiller. Now, you mentioned in the trends, uh, Tom, AI and cybersecurity. Now, Given your experience and expertise, you know, in, in, I would say both, like, how do you see AI will be playing a better role in enhancing the cybersecurity strategies and solutions in the coming years? Because, of course, like, th there is a trend now and everyone is trying to jump on the bandwagon as they say, hey, we have an AI-powered product, but at the end of the day, it's just like a marketing thing. But what really AI can do in the cybersecurity space, because 
And sorry for it being a long question. Yeah, no problem. We are, we are starting to see as well that the bad actors are using AI as well as a way to, 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 to initiate their attacks. You're right. Actually, um, it's an arms race. And so to your point that um, the, the hackers are using AI to, be, to create better phishing um, attacks, for example, um, to facilitate identity theft, um, to do AI applies to code analysis, um, et cetera, and, and finds holes in code that, that it previously wasn't able to, to uh, happen before, uh, where it was more manual. Um, and so the, it's an arms race from a cybersecurity perspective of the bad guys are now using AI. So the good guys, the people that provide defensive or even offensive solutions also need to, to leverage AI. And uh, what makes AI really click is having high quality data to automate the decision making to make that happen. The, the bad guys are obviously they have uh, in the dark web, you know, millions and billions of, of data points of personal information, right. uh, et cetera. So I really think that the organizations uh, that are selling cybersecurity that are focusing on AI need to uh, need to differentiate themselves by actually providing and having good feeds of data, um, et cetera. And I think that's the key thing is either you connect to a, a, a broad set of uh, other products that, that collect and you can correlate that information um, or you're associated with a large platform vendor um, and you're able to see massive amounts of traffic. Um, and so, you know, to be candid, AI, probably if the bigger companies, be it the big tech companies, like look at Google, they bought Mandiant, right? They, and, mm -hmm. uh, and obviously Microsoft has security products and they've got all that data with all their usage of Azure, same thing with Amazon, et cetera. Uh, so it's really unlocking the, the data to make the AI even better as well. So to me, the differentiation is not only do you have AI, but, you know, do you have high quality data to facilitate? And so I think, you know, if I were to talk to an enterprise who is looking at AI enabled products, uh, I, I think they need to not only, you know, look at the, the quality of the actual algorithms, but look at the quality of the data that they're making the decision making based off of. Uh, again, this is very good insight, Tom, and being some, someone from technical background who also worked for enterprise sales as well. Now, what I, and now in being a consultant, what I tell customers, please go ask two questions when someone comes and tell you I have an AI powered product. First of all, how large is your data? And yep. what kind of data you have. And the second thing, of course, about the algorithms, which algorithms you use to, to, to get, you know, the, the, the results that you are aiming for. So this is really something uh, I agree with you on. Now, like you, you have, again, this experience, uh, Tom, as a CEO, as an investor, as an author, policy advisor. How have these different roles influenced your perspective on the tech industry and its trajectory? Yeah, you know, I also have the fortune, not only <clears throat> having done those roles, but but I've seen multiple iterations uh, of, of technology platforms come and get replaced. And I think the key thing is, you know, <laughs> in, in technology, you have new platforms continuously replacing old platforms. And ironically, you need the kind of the same stuff that you had before in the old environment but it needs to be applicable to the new environment. So yeah, you need security in the mainframe. Then there was client server, then there was, uh, you know, cloud computing, then there was web, there's web three, et cetera. So what I see is, is that, you know, history, what I've learned is that history repeats itself in that, and that the people that there, where they can be successful is that they can build products that are optimized for the new platforms. I think the challenge for startups is, you know, are you betting on that the new platform will actually take off? Some, there's been a lot of, like everyone was talking about, uh, you know, 
blockchain and all that stuff. That's, you know, and people are thinking, oh, that's going to be the next big thing and, and, and Web3. And, and we haven't seen that, right? And so people try to build all these security products and all these other types of application development products for this platform. It hasn't taken off. Uh, but there are other platforms that have taken off uh, as well. So I think the key thing is, is that, um, you know, just trying to time it by looking at where the, the change in platforms that, that are happening. Can you ride that wave, not be too early, not be too late and making sure you kind of, it's almost like surfing, right? You got to pick the right wave and hope that wave can take you in the, uh, yeah. in. in. Um, I think the other things that, you know, through my different roles that I've had, Again, it goes back to hiring and partnering with the right people. It, it's critical. And so no matter what I've done in terms of investing or being a CEO or, or, or doing policy advisory work, mm -hmm. it's, it all depends on having high quality people. Uh, and then, you know, kind of associated with that is, you know, treat people with respect through and through as you never know down the road if they become your boss or potentially yeah. you you you're at a startup and they're they're the manager at a big company that uh, you're hoping would acquire you as well. So I think those are some of the things that at the end of the day, you know, as much as we talk technology, um, you know, this industry is very much driven by people, by relationships, and you want to surround yourself with high quality people. And then going back to my first point is is that uh, you know, it there's constant uh, new platforms replacing old mm -hmm. uh, and trying to kind of time things properly uh, where there where there can be the biggest opportunities uh, for people, not only professionally, but but new startups to be successful. I love, again, this approach, Tom, especially when you mentioned about the relationship, because you might have the most fascinating uh, tech, but, you know, if, if you are doing it from relationship perspective the wrong way, you know, that, that doesn't count. And we saw a lot of examples. Now, I, I want to ask a little bit about the book that yes. you have authored containing big, big tech, uh, how to protect our civil rights, economy and democracy. Uh, like the title by itself, it's very, you know, I would say thought provoking. So can you please share a little bit about what motivated you to write the book and some key insights readers can expect? Of course, guys, if you are watching or listening to us, I advise you to read. Like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this because I get curious. So if you can just brief us, uh, Tom, about the book and what drove you to, to write it. Yeah, you know, um, I felt that, uh, you know, coming from the tech industry, founding companies, and then especially focusing a lot on privacy and cybersecurity, uh, that those are the areas where there's a lot of concerns regarding big tech. You know, are they collecting too much of your information? Um, do they have too much information that can be weaponized against you that could lead, for example, to identity theft, et cetera? So I felt that um, I had, you know, good practical domain knowledge in this area. Um, I've also, with companies that I started and companies I've invested in, uh, competed against some of these big tech players, partnered with them. So I think I had a kind of a unique perspective there. And then what, what I found was, was that, you know, most of the books looking at big tech were tend to be written more by very good books, but they tend to be written more by academics as opposed to someone in the industry that kind of lives and breathes the stuff like you and I do as well. At the same time, th there's been some significant changes that have been happening. And we just, we've been talking about AI and actually I feel very fortunate that when I wrote this book last year in 2020, I started in the early part of 2022, I said, AI is going to be where it's at, right? And so the yeah. nice thing is I wrote all this stuff about it and, you know, thought it through. And then uh, after I submitted the book to the publisher, and it's going to be available in uh, August of 2023, but it's available right now for pre-ordering if you're listening to this before August, that there's been an explosion of announcements that Microsoft has invested in OpenAI. Bard has come out with, uh, I mean, sorry, Google's come out with Bard. Uh, Microsoft's integrating, uh, you know, ChatGPT into uh, Bing. the Bing, uh, et cetera. And so I, I think, um, I, not that I was a savant, 
but I thought AI was going to be big and it plays a big role. And so I spent a lot of time and the majority of the book, it actually does involve AI. So I kind of feel very fortunate that I kind of timed it just perfectly. There've been other changes, uh, more from a political perspective, uh, and, and civil rights perspective in the U S uh, the, the Dobbs decision replaced uh, Roe v. Wade. And so now some of the data that, that big tech companies collect can be used against people, right? Um, uh, at least in the United States right here. Um, and then the final thing is, is that I, I also felt that, that there's been short shrift to the fact that these big tech companies um, have become monopolies. And mm -hmm. the monopolies um you know actually can have a significant impact on these future technologies so you know what what do you need with ai you need a lot of computing power and you need a lot of data well who has the computing power it's the cloud providers which are the big tech guys who has the data it's the big tech guys right and so they actually have the inside track on this next new big wave uh, etc and so I think it's really, we really need to look at, you know, does it make sense to have so much concentration of power in key markets associated with that as well? So it was kind of these confluence of all these things, my personal background, where I thought I had some unique experiences, mm -hmm. the, the changes that were happening, both from uh, law as well as happening with AI, and the fact that the big tech players were getting bigger and bigger and the industry has been consolidating and there have been fewer startups that have been happening or they that they completely avoid specific space like you would never join a startup company that's trying to do a mobile operating system that's stupid right because there's only no. you know there's right you would never you know come out with a, a new search engine right there was actually a company called neva that was going to use ai to do search they said, you know what? We're no longer going to do consumer. This just happened the other week. We're just going to do enterprise as well. It's difficult to compete against these people. And so there's now what I say, I think there's about 10 large markets that are kind of um, no fly zones for, for startups and VCs to invest in them as well. And I don't think that's fundamentally healthy. I've got some ideas uh, what, what can be done. And so one of the things that I've done as it relates to digital surveillance and privacy, when it comes to cybersecurity, when it comes to AI, when it comes to competition in this book, not only do I try to connect the dots, but I also try to actually provide solutions uh, as well that are, that are pretty straightforward um, that, that, that people can do. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to also influence the way that people look at the large providers of technology uh, with this book. I'm looking forward to, to have it, actually. Um, now you touched on the points of data privacy, uh, Tom. Now, whether I am a startup or maybe I'm one of the established guys in the market. So when, when we talk about AI, we should talk about data. Now, there's, I think, a very thin line there that, you know, we should be taking care of because how we can achieve privacy, right? Like, because we need the data. If we think like, for example, why, and, you know, I mentioned a few examples. If Netflix is able to suggest to us which uh, movie or which uh, series I might like, it's because of some data points they, connect, they collected about me. Same thing goes for Amazon. Same thing can go for anything else. Now, how tech uh, companies and startups, of course, can better integrate this privacy security consideration um, especially again, like I'm aware about the California uh, Act and you know the GDPR, which is also we use it here uh, in Dubai because we have a lot of expats, so it applies yes. to us as, as well. So I want to develop something, but at the same time, I need to take care of the regulations. How I can do this balance, Tom? Well, I think it first and foremost uh, starts with um, having a clear definition of, of what you want to do and what you want to accomplish. I, I, I think the problem is, is that the mindset was, well, let's just collect all this information and let's just use it every way. Let me give you an example of that. Actually, Facebook uh, violated and wasn't transparent and they got, and this was part of the fine that they got for $5 billion. You know how 
um, people will say, hey, to improve your security, put in your phone number and we'll do multi-factor authentication, right? Yeah. So, so they tell people that we're going to use this to, to verify. Well, it turned out Facebook said, oh my God, we got all, we got a, you know, hundreds of millions of phone numbers. Well, let's market to them, right? Let's market to these, mm. let, let's, let's, let's allow people to do this or let's correlate this together, et cetera. No. So the first thing is, is that you need to, in the design process, say, what is the minimum amount of data that I need to do to accomplish whatever product I have? And then be transparent with your end users and say, we're collecting this information for these reasons uh, as well. Um, and uh, so that's, I think that's, but people forget about that. I think the mindset is, well, we'll just keep on collecting information and maybe it's not useful now, but maybe we can monetize it down the road. And that was the mindset that that when companies were just serving ads in the past that, oh, eventually we'll dust off this data and, and we can, you know, serve up more ads uh, for this type of stuff. Well, the problem is, is that the regulations have caught up to consumer expectations and, you know, there needs to be the limitations of the use of information and data that that's collected. The other thing is, which I know this is near and dear to your heart, is that, you know, you have to, like the old days was like, hey, let's be loosey-goosey with the data internally. Let's share it. You know, as uh, Facebook said, you know, go fast, break things, et cetera. But, but with people's data that you're storing, um, if there is a breach, if you're a startup and you get breached, then all, no matter how much VC money you raised and all these awards mm -hmm. you won and all that stuff, that can kill you, right? Because every competitor is going to go in and say, oh, well, you know, you got breached as well. So I, I really think that, that there needs to be kind of a shift left of the privacy and cybersecurity concerns and baking them more into the development process and into the product design. I think that's where it really you know, needs to start. So that's, that's my suggestion right there, which is don't think of cybersecurity, don't think of privacy as something you add at the end. It's something that you need to bake in as well. Um, yeah, like because, I, and unfortunately I would say, Tom, um, at least I'm talking about in the part of the world where I am, uh, I yes. see that this is, people are still doing the same mistake. Uh, let's get the tech done. Let's get, you know, things uh, up and running. And then we will think about cybersecurity later. I'm not, I hope that this will change, but I'm seeing like looking at cybersecurity and specifically about, you know, the privacy issues. Okay. When it happens, let's deal with it. So far, we are good. So they are delaying actually the problem, which it's, it's like a, a time bomb, I call it. You don't know when yeah. it can explode in your, in your face. Now, again, like related to this, before I shift to, to, to the startup and, you know, the, the other discussions I want to have, um, what are the most challenging policy issues that you have faced uh, in your role as policy advisor? And how did you navigate that? Yeah, you know, it's funny because probably a lot of your audience and you and me, you know, we can sit down and in a conference room or over zoom, et cetera. And in the end, we can probably agree like, Hey, this is the stuff that needs to be done. But, you know, but policy, uh, will eventually, you know, need to be run through, uh, the political system, the political environments and politics is a, a you know, rough and tumble sport, right? There are, special interests that don't want change um, as change introduces risk to the incumbent providers. In the United States, we have not passed a major privacy law since HIPAA, 1996. There hasn't wow. been, I mean, you, 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 and it, it's so difficult to, to make changes. So HIPAA, Graham, Leach, Bliley, et cetera, are all pre-iPhone. They're pre-Google. They're pre-Meta, right? And now we have a situation, at least in the United States, where the apps that we use have a lot of our sensitive health information. They're, you know, we got the watches, you know, we, we've got other things that are tracking our personal stuff. Uh, you know, maybe uh, if someone has an illness, they're, they're entering into the app, you know, how they're feeling or 
you know, yeah. you know, et cetera. In the United States, that's not covered because it's a it's a healthcare app. It's not it's not a covered what what it's known as a covered entity, which takes electronic payments, right? You know, like a hospital or a insurance company, et cetera. Um, and so, and you would think like, oh yeah, we need to extend, you know, these same rights that we have for covered entities to uh, mobile devices that do health information and also healthcare apps. It hasn't happened because, um, you know, there, there's a reluctance to do that as well. So, so what I'm finding is you really need to build a coalition of of organizations and groups to get politicians to to support things. And so you really need to attach policy to to real real world kitchen table problems. And yeah. I think this is very similar what what you've experienced in the enterprise space that you know it just can't be a a TCO spreadsheet it's got to map to how does the make the business better and how is it strategic? And the same thing applies in policy. You got to make it strategic that, that the, that, you know, Joe Blow consumer cares about this and gets the politicians on board. So it's, it's very interesting. It's, it's kind of doing policy is almost like doing enterprise sales. You got to have a must have, a uh, solution that that not only yeah not only could potentially save money but also you know helps move the ball forward in a strategic manner as well and I, and I think that's uh, one thing that I've learned that uh, is that you know you you just like in sales you, you got to make it appeal um, and you got to make it to like solve a real pain point uh, you you just can't be a you can't be in the vitamin business. Yeah, that's that's you know like me, that resonated because I was one one um, you know back back in the days sitting on the other side also like I was on the client side. Yeah, and I think yeah like the way if we put it in in as you explain a strategic way and you know what it will add to the business, I think we will save a lot of time and you know it will save uh, efforts from the people because at least we know exactly why we are doing it. It's not like just because someone asked us to. Hey, I need a policy for you know uh, accessing equipment or so on. You know, like yeah. as simple as this. So, so it always makes sense. Now, uh, Tom, you've been as a founder, and you know, you just mentioned a couple of startups that you invested in. The yeah. question is, what are some of you know the I would say uh, traits that you you look at when you decide to put your money. Uh, in a tech startup. So what are some of the qualities? What are some of the key elements uh, that they have uh, implemented so they can attract your attention? Yeah, I think the first thing is, is it, it has to be a team. It just can't be one person. I, sometimes I'm approached by entrepreneurs and it's just them. And they're like, oh, you know, can you be an angel investor? I want to raise a million dollars. Can you put some money into it? And I'm going to get some other people. And I'm like, well, what if you get hit by a bus? Then the money disappears because it's just you, <laughs> right? And so it needs to be a team, right? It, it, and if you, if you as an entrepreneur cannot attract another person to do this journey, how the heck are you going to be able to convince customers, right? So it first starts with the founder bringing on other founders. And that team has to have some unique DNA and expertise that's going to be differentiable, that they have to have something in their brains um, that's unique to them that is not any Joe Blow off the street, um, you know, would, would know or figure out, et cetera. So that's the first thing. It's a, it's a team sport and you got to be good at what you do in terms of expertise, domain knowledge, et cetera that you uniquely can, can solve this problem. Uh, we talked about it before. It has to be a must have product, right? It has to be a no vitamins. It has to be a painkiller that, that people will say, yes, in a tough economic times, I'm going to make budget for that. It needs to also not be in too, it needs to be in a nice market, but it, it can't be too competitive. There's a, uh, the, the person that came from uh, PayPal, Peter Thiel, He's also was involved with uh, Palantir, et cetera. He said competition is for losers. He, he said that, I don't know, 10, yeah. 12 years ago. 
uh, in a uh, presentation he gave at Stanford, which is not too far away from where I'm sitting right here. And it basically means that, you know, you tell the VCs, oh, we're going to be in a super large market. But in the end, you really want to kind of narrow the initial version one that addresses so that there's not too many competitive friction right there. Um, and so you can really attack the market. And then from there, you, the ability to grow into a, a adjacent market. So it's, you know, I think there's some common themes in my conversation. It's, it's about people. It's about the quality of the team. It's about having something that, that's significant and, and it's not too competitive. You don't want to be number 87 in the queue outside the CISO or the CIO's office. You want to be number two or three in line outside another person that has some money um, that, that uh, you can sell to. And that makes it much easier to be able to get some initial lighthouse customers and then land and expand from there. And this applies not only for cybersecurity, Tom, right? Like any, any tech oh, enterprise. Oh, all, all tech, all tech uh, yeah. you know, that you sell to the enterprise. Um, absolutely. This is just, you know, to me, and again, I'm not just, you know, I've, I've done my, my last uh, at Centrify, that was a cybersecurity company. Um, but if you look at my investments, you know, uh, there's a data collaboration company in Poland uh, that, that I'm invested in. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there's a, you know, data privacy companies. There's some, these geospatial companies like Enroute and Ivy, et cetera, uh, et cetera. So yeah, I mean, those, those are not pure cyber, they're not cybersecurity companies at all. And, uh, and, uh, but, but those, but they, they have to have those check boxes for me to invest in them. Also on that, because I'm, I'm asking this just for me also to learn honestly Please. and for, for fellow people to maybe learn. Like sometimes uh, you mentioned about like uh, Peter Thiel, like, you know, and his famous book, Zero to One, and try to avoid being in a crowded market. Now, but sometimes we see founders and we see companies that they enter a market which is saturated, but they say, we are, you know, changing the status quo. Like how really this can be true unless they are really, you know, like, changing the whole concept and coming with another concept. What, what do you think about that? Yeah. You know, have you built a feature um, that, that, and, and the real look, if you enter a crowded market and, and you say, I've got this thing and no one else has it and you start winning deals from the other people, then the reality is, is that the other vendors are either going to drop everything and copy it, or they're going to lie and they're going to say they have it as well. Right. And so you just can't rest your laurels just having one differentiated feature or capability. It's much better that you actually are built on a new platform, a new emerging platform. And so, you know, so the other people, when they say, oh, well, you know, we're better than that. And then you can look at them and say, no, they're built on this old technology we're on the new technology. So it's like the difference, you know, like uh, Salesforce, right? right? You know, their competitors were clients, the Siebel and the others that were client server were cloud. It was a new paradigm, et cetera. So to me, it's important that you really can't just be number seven or number eight doing the same old, same old in the same market. You know, everyone's built on the same platform. What's really important, what's really needed is you're actually built, you have a completely different en underlying engine that's, that represents the new technology, it's, et cetera. Um, even though in the end with the version one, you may be delivering the same thing, but, but then people start seeing that. Like, you know, I, I mentioned Okta before and Centrify, we competed yeah. with Okta. You know, there was single sign-on solutions, but they were the, you know, they built it into the cloud, um, et cetera. You know, same thing, you know, like a big differentiator for some tech companies is that they're open source and they get the benefits of, of open source as opposed to being a closed model as well. And so those are kind of the bigger things like that's old technology, this is new, or it's a different business model or, or underlying development platform, um, you know, open source versus closed, et cetera. Those are the big things that actually in the end will make the difference as opposed to yeah, we're built on the same, 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 but we have 
feature X and no one else has it. Trust me, within a year, that that differentiation is going to disappear or it's going to be so blurred in the buyer's mind that you really need to, you know, it's like the difference between, you know, a test, you're going in and you have a Tesla that's an EV and then you got gas powered, you're being compared to gas powered cars, right? It's got to be like that. You know, like it's a spot on, that's what I would tell you, Tom. This is exactly the answer I wanted to to hear from you because sometimes, again, from a consultant perspective now, I'm, I'm not... Uh, tied to any to any vendor but i get irritated sometimes like by messages you know like yeah we have liberalized you know this but actually yeah you you added a feature and the other guys as you said and i liked it they will either lie and they will say yes we have it or they will bring something similar to it in a very future one yeah. question and uh, you know before we we close with uh, tom and it's a bit about you actually because again when i was preparing um for for this episode I've seen that you have studied both computer science and history at the University of Michigan. How do these two areas intersect in your work? And, you know, what lessons from history do you think are applicable to the tech industry today? Well, um, I'm going to paraphrase, but Steve Jobs at the launch of the iPad, I believe it was actually the iPad 2. Um, and this is kind of a famous quote. And so, again, I'm going to try to paraphrase that. But he said something to the effect of technology alone or by itself is not enough. It's technology married with the liberal arts yeah. that, that, that yields results that make our hearts sing. And so to me, and again, I know a lot of your, because it's the CTO show and uh, you obviously are dealing with uh, technical people that are in the enterprise, that are in the B2B world, maybe they offer some B2C. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, the vast majority of actual end users of, of software products or cloud products, et cetera, are not the super techie scientists or CTOs, right? There's only like one CTO in an organization, right? And, but the, the rest of the users, um, are not computer scientists. They're they're just regular humans, right? Um, and I think it, it, it's it's good to have kind of that liberal arts influence in terms of um, you know kind of knowing that you can't just you know bits and you can't throw bits and bytes or whatever. That the the most successful you know products, a lot of the um, the, the majority of the successful products you know, you know, have a end user experience. And nowadays, because we're so spoiled with the the beauty of the 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 mobile experience that we get with iPhones and Androids, et cetera, that's the expectation that people have that it should be a single click, et cetera. And so I think, you know, with my background of doing both computer science and history, you know, it just gives me a, a better appreciation that, um, you know, you kind of need to, you know, right brain, left brain, you kind of need to marry the two as to paraphrase Steve Jobs. Um, and th that's when you can really, you know, hit, hit upon it. And so it's important that, you know, you have, you know, good user interface people, right, that are not pure techies that are that are used to dealing yeah. with humans um, out there. and. And, uh, and if you can nail a great interface, user interface, then that helps out significantly. Um, you touch on something personally, I, I like also as well. And I hope one day, other than the user interface, we can get the marriage between, uh, tech and uh, arts in general in the B2B business, because I think like Apple uh, and Steve Jobs, he was like pioneer in this, he managed to get this artistic aspects to uh, end consumers product whether it's from uh, you know computers uh, ipad the iphone and all the other products that uh, he he came out up with i wish we see this because currently in, in you know and here allow me tom to put my two cents i think the tech b2b is lacking this today and it's all about features and you know knobs and 
all these things and yeah. I hope that we, we, we reach because I believe that B2B business, I mean, tech, I'm talking about tech here, could reach, you know, the same, you know, like how, for example, we, we stand in the line for a new iPhone, like why we don't have the same thing for a B2B tech. Of course, we never saw this before, but I mean, why not? Um, well, Tom, before we close, any final thoughts, any final thing you want to say? No, this has been a great conversation across the board, and I, I really appreciate you taking the time. And, uh, you know, um, I think this gives you a sense for my background that, that went into, you know, looking at the societal issues of this technology. So we've been, I know a lot of it, we've been talking about, you know, enterprise software, and that, that's my background. But to your point, you know, applying it to humans and the rest of society and and making sure that there's a nice marriage between the technology and and that it it respects humans, uh, et cetera. And, and that was kind of the motivation behind you know writing containing big tech. And uh, and so if anyone's interested, based on this, you can go to my website tomkemp.ai. I have a blog where I write on technology. I write on entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also uh, if you go to containingbigtech.com. Uh, then that they'll take you right to uh, Amazon where you can, uh, you know, order uh, as well. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I've been trying to uh, take my technology and my enterprise focus and say, you know, hey, how can we, you know, make society and, and, and uh, you know, better and make sure that our, our civil rights are protected, right? And I yep. think that's, re that's really key because as you know, that with all this data about us, that it, it, you know, it's not just about serving ads. That that identity theft can happen, right. bad things can happen, and and so we do need the the appropriate cybersecurity. We need the privacy, et cetera, to ensure that uh, we don't become victims of having our identity stolen, et cetera. Yeah, great. By the way, I will put uh, you know the website you mentioned, Tom. I will put it in the description of the episode, whether uh, for anyone who's watching this now on uh, YouTube or you will be what, uh, listening on your favorite podcasting platform. I will make sure that also the link is there. And again, just final thing from me before I close. The main reason I decided to start this podcast and I call it the CTO. I know that many people will think, oh, it's very techy. It's not. Yeah, we cover technology. We we talk about you know the impact of technology, but main reason or motivation for me for starting this podcast is to do this as you mentioned this marriage between you know the technology, the business, the people. Because yeah. at the end of the day, it's all about the people for us. I, I enjoyed uh, the discussion a lot with you, Tom. Like you have you know a lot of experience, and I'm sure like uh, people who will be watching or will be listening will enjoy also as well. Uh, and as usual, when it's time for closing, I repeat this. If anyone has a question about this episode or the show in general, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. You find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, and you can find my email also as well. And if you are interested to become a guest, same as I had Tom today, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. We can discuss and we can arrange for this. And don't forget to subscribe, tell everyone about the show we have a lot of information we are sharing with you and i hope that you are enjoying it also as well and as i say at the end thank you very much and until we meet the next episode thank you thank you